After 70 years of Welsh broadcasting, the odd touch of vaulting ambition and a certain self-belief might seem understandable, forgivable, even a might desirable. But to have your own studio in Broadway? Lime Grove, yes. Alexandra Palace, by all means. But Broadway in Cardiff? <whistles> the street with a chapel that became a shrine to Welsh broadcasting. Cross my heart. The fire totally destroyed a whole city block. An area about the size of a football field has been gutted. It started in a carpet and furniture showroom and spread to adjoining shops, flats, community centre and the former BBC studios in Broadway. That building was being used as a mosque, but was once the centre for BBC Wales' entire output of drama, current affairs and light entertainment programmes. In the 1950s, the studio's output went wide. Give my regards to Broadway, remember me to the Herald Square. Also, long collared shirts with the tie made over the same stuff as the shirt was made of. It's like camouflage. This is the studio used to be, wasn't it? Yeah, this was the main studio, yeah, Studio A, and there's a small studio down the back there. I'm going to smoke in the studio there. <laughs> Highly legal. You weren't allowed to smoke? Oh, no. I oh, he's falling off, off the wagon. Oh, oh, isn't it terrible? But we're in a 1950s bus. <laughs> on 1950s <laughs> money. Oh, yeah. I don't blame you. <laughs> so it's a 1950s oh, habit. Oh, you, you, you've yeah. fallen yeah. from grace. What, you're going to put a BBC studio as you? No, they used to be here. It used to be a mosque, didn't it? Before that was BBC. <laughs> So, if you don't come in, you have through that door there. You came into the door, right. this is the scene dock here. Right. So, Studio A was there, yeah. Studio B was there, yeah. and the dressing rooms and the makeup rooms were on that wall. It was an inside job. Doing those, there was a cameraman that pinched it. <laughs> it was him. <laughs> Main entrance into, uh, into Broadway. Um, this is what death is. You know, you go to an empty car park. <laughs> anyway. Doing a play live, see? Yes, yeah. And um, I can remember more vividly wandering around these streets, waiting for the play to start. Yes. Just going for a breather. Breath of fresh air. Terrifying. Live plays were terrifying. The BBC rang up, right? And said, we've got 40 minutes live. <laughs> After the news, you want it. Well, that's why I came here first to the studio. Uh, and this is new. I think this guy's extended his backyard. <laughs> I hope you have planning permission. Um, and I'd be talking to the studio audience, I'm talking now. Nobody else knew the show was going out on the air. There was no warmer, no studio manager saying, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, to put people in their best suits. It was very relaxed. And for I was dying with emphysemia. Emphysemia. Uh, and in one day, in the club just over there, we had Christmas Eve from two till four. That's right. Christmas Day from <laughs> four till six. They said that never lived Boxing the same Day years. from yeah. six till eight. <laughs> Wake after that. New Year's <laughs> Eve from eight till ten. <laughs> and the coffin? And the coffin. He was asking about the... Um, Cardiff. What, uh, yes, the, the Cardiff Language Society. Cardiff Language. The Cardiff Language Society. That's right. Was he found here? He was in it. Ronnie Williams was in it. 
number one. I found a member. Yeah. And you got to wear daps. You had to wear a green tie on a Friday. That's and the women nice. had to wear green knickers. It was a tremendously relaxed atmosphere, wasn't it? Oh, See, the trouble great. with BBC you now, or any organisation now, it's just full of accountants. Yes. It's accountants now. It's accountants. It's not showbiz anymore. Well, it's business now. The spontaneity is gone. The, uh, yeah. that, see what happens, that risk. Yeah, they want to. You put people together. together. Yeah. Everything's so expensive now. That's right. It's too expensive to Well, risk. this is a risk program now. Yeah. It's a big risk. <laughs> this will never go up, you know. No, because there's no script. Mark my words, this will no, never go up. No up-up. script, no research, no. nothing, just yeah. doing it. No cameras, no tape, no, no roof. No. No. Never properly. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Anne. Cool. This, is, this is Angela, incidentally. Cool. And my gallstones have uh, I've cleared up now, thank God. <laughs> You're a wonderful cook, but boy, oh boy. <laughs> Can I get you anything, Julian? <laughs> no, thanks. No, please, Ash. <laughs> You've done enough already. God bless you. I'll have another cup of coffee. Is that your cup? Unfortunately, yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, darling. It's very kind of you. And for a joke, I said to these two secretaries, I said, my mother's not happy about me being in, in the BBC, you know? Yes. And uh, this one woman said, why well, ever not? And I said, well, she said it's... Uh, He's full of drug addicts and nymphomaniacs. <laughs> and she turned to the other secretary and she said, I've never taken drugs in my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, this is one of my sets, for God's sake, look at it. Oh. Don't show me the camera, I'm so ashamed of it. <laughs> Good <laughs> God, I... Look at this. That's that him, sir. Now, who was that there? Oh, uh, uh, Dan Fruit. Dan Fruit. That's Dan Fruit, is it? James. Yeah, yeah. Good very good. Good. Very good makeup. I wouldn't have yeah. him. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, do come along. It won't take a minute. It's just I have a little seat. Yeah. Do please come along. Now, this is not going to take a minute. Yes, yes. Now, if we could only have a big smile. <laughs> Splendid. I was mentioning it to somebody the other day, and I worked in Broadway, and the look of total um, sh astonishment and disbelief. You didn't work in Broadway. Yes, I did. I said, happiest time of my life working in Broadway. And I started to talk about Broadway, and this wonderful look of disbelief melted away, because then he realized that I was talking about Broadway Cardiff, not the Broadway. It's a marvelous name, isn't it? Broadway. I can imagine your name has been lights, but actually it was quite a glittery place because do you know that all the streets round were called after gems? It was a strange little area because you know there's Ruby Street, Sapphire Street, all these glittering diamonds, and then suddenly you're confronted with this terrible, terrible antiquated Welsh chapel. With Indian lights, BBC on it. <laughs> and to me at the time, it, it epitomized really um, the whole BBC setup because. They said that the BBC in Wales was run by the Son of the Manse, or the Sons of the Manse. That should be enough to bury him, folks. There were the two directors, David Griffith and David Thomas, and they didn't know many actors, fortunately for me, because they were in radio, and all they knew were radio actors. And of course, I'd been in quite a few films, and so I came in as somebody who actually appeared on vision, and uh, it was marvelous because I worked for David and I worked for David, and virtually in every production, I went from one production to another, playing costume drama, punch drunk boxers. I mean, it was wonderful for a young actor. Uh, and probably, as you know, talking about Broadway, it, it, it was the old out, outside broadcast cameras on bicycle tires, and yet the, the programs were networked. There wasn't BBC Wales as such, they went out BBC One. And, I mean, the critics loved the drama that came. I mean, we were the, the, the top kiddies in those days.
Which are made long and me waiting. Why? Today at dawn, my brother sails for France. A busy monarch, Henry. What's that to me? And we used to work all night and put a set in, and we used to record the following day and take it out and put another one in. And it was actually seven day working. It was an extraordinary, sort of high productivity place. As I say, it was all live. And of course, the, 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 the atmosphere, the nervous tension in the studio, uh, or, or anywhere at that time, was actually was tangible. You'd go to, let's say, you'd go to the gents doing liner before you went on air, and you'd see grown men, I mean, remember, you know, not just actors, you know, members of the scene, crew, camera, you'd, you'd see them physically vomiting with nerves, because you knew, once you were in there, once they closed the dock doors, once the, the light went on, and some disembodied voice from London, usually females, said, okay, Carl, if you take it away, it's all yours, you knew, from then on, for the next 90 minutes, that was you. The sun hums down through the cotton flowers of her dress into the bell of her heart and buzzes in the honey there and cutches and kisses, lazy loving and booze in her red buried breast. She blazes naked past the sailor's arms, the only woman on the die adamed earth. Sinbad Sailors places on her thighs, still dew damp from the first man growing cockcrow garden, his reverent goat bearded hands. I don't care if he is common, she whispers to her salad day deep self. I want to gobble him up. I thought, right, we'll do the rescuers. And this was a ridiculous decision when you think of it because the studio was so small and the rescuers was a true happening uh, described a pit disaster in Tina with and the Ronda where a tremendous fall of rock and coal had blocked one of the shafts one problem and that was that we couldn't see any dust or anything which would be an essential part of the pit with all this wind coming through, you see. So somebody suggested, why not use cocoa? So they filled everything with cocoa, and then when the explosion happened, they, whoom, they sent this explosion through. Unbelievable. I had cocoa up my nose, in my eyes, in my ears. And there was a cloud of dust. Really terrifying. Mass of oh, terrible dust. And uh, it looked wonderful, and we could see it very clearly. I mean, it went everywhere. I think Broadway had the cleaners in there for a fortnight. It must have cost more on cleaners than the budget for the whole production, I think. And as I say myself, unbelievable. I mean, you know, I still got a bit of an eye. <laughs> it was called uh, a car in a thicket. A car in a thicket. And I played a mortician, an undertaker which was the leading role. And um, uh, I remember, I don't think I was off the screen for a moment for whatever it was, an hour and a half, I don't know. But it was curious about the evolving structure of acting in Wales, because quite a few people were, well, were not wholly professional though they were paid for that job. It was a tradition of amateurism. I, I say that in no spirit of criticism, but I remember at the end of this saga, this terrifying saga of 90 minutes of being in front of the camera and hitting it on the nose, it went fine, that a gentleman whose first profession, I believe, was a solicitor, who was in it with a small part, came up to me and he said, Mr. Griffith, he said, if I may say so, that was a tremendous performance. And I'd, tell me, are you thinking of taking it up full time? And I can't describe them. They were just silly days when you look back on them. Because the newsroom was in Park Place, and the studio was in Broadway, a mile and a half away. 
and we used to pile into this taxi at about half past 11 with the deadline of 12 to get there. In the whole of the time I was news editor here, we didn't miss one bulletin. I didn't work in Sandef at all. Don't forget, the news department today have got every technical facility they want, but in those days we had absolutely nothing. You know that film, which is a big part of the news in those days, 16 mil, was processed by Robinson, the cameraman, on his own amateur sort of outfit down, in, down near Arms Park. It's now feared that nearly 200 lives were lost when the coal tip at Abervan near Merthyr Tidwell slid forward today. It engulfed an infant school and a row of houses. The 64-year-old headmistress of the school has just been brought out alive. For the latest news, over to Cardiff. Fatalities in the South Wales tip disaster may reach 200. The figure was quoted tonight at a press conference by the Chief Constable of Merthyr Tidville, Mr Thomas Griffiths. He used to do the news in a corner of Studio B, and they'd have um, perhaps three interviewees in. And if the script was wrong, the actual news script, or if the floor manager put them in the wrong order, what would happen was this, that I, the newsreader, would say, um, well, um, apropos of the, whatever subject it was, we've asked Mr. William uh, Williams in from uh, Pantakelin, and he'd be sitting at the far end. And with a single camera, it meant the camera went off, the newsreader, onto Mr. Allen, who would nod, onto Mr. Jones, who would nod, to Mr. Williams. And then the interview would take place. Then, thank you very much, Mr. Williams. Then the camera would come back, past Mr. Davis, would nod, past Mr. Allen, would nod, and back to New Zealand. What the cameraman, this one particular cameraman used to do, I won't name him, he used to come in, he used to lock you off in a mid-shot, and then he'd sit on the pedestal then, and he'd read the Daily Mirror, you see. And then he'd leave it in the mid-shot, and that's it. That's fine, you know, if everything goes right. But this one particular evening, something went wrong. Now, we always took into the studio with us a standby, be it a, a little joke or, or a poem or a, a cutting from the newspaper, something we could refer to um, and spend sort of 30 seconds, 45 seconds reading it while upstairs they went around madly trying to find something else, you know, and another item for the programme or getting somebody on the phone, whatever, filling in. And I, what I used to do is I used to sit in the studio and then I'd put this piece of paper down on the chair and sit on it, you see. So now, of course, something did go wrong. I, f I think a film broke down or something. And I said, well, uh, something's gone wrong, but uh, as luck would have it, I said, I have a little poem. And it wasn't there, of course. So I panicked and I got up, right? Now, I'm still in a mid-shot. The cameraman is still reading the Daily Mirror. He doesn't adjust, so what they see at home is this. I'm getting up on my feet, standing up like that, and then you hear this disembodied voice saying, but I had it with me when I came into the studio. Hello. Well, my first memory was one of alarm. Good evening. Very special welcome to a special edition of this programme. When we were going to I did the first sports programme on television from Wales. And I shared a program with West of England. And Ronnie Allison, who became the Queen's press secretary, he was presenting there and I was in Cardiff. So I was waiting, typical of me, see feet up like this, chatting, cigarette. And suddenly Ronnie handed over a minute early. So the first shot of me ever on television, you will, was a cigarette with my feet in the desk, which was rather naughty anyway. But it was a, a time when, isn't it strange, people, uh, they treated themselves not seriously, treated their job seriously. The sparks always used to be on the lighting gallery, which is above looking down on the studio. And if there was ever, ever any noise in the studio, it was always the sparks' fault. And Brad and Griffiths was always had a, I thought, always had a down on sparks. And uh, the control for this transmitter for his cans were on the gallery, on a switch. And Brad and used to, as I say, blame the sparks. And immediately did that, we used to start switching his cans so he couldn't hear his talk back. And he used to go absolutely wild. And he used to say that every time I come in the studio, he said, I can never get a decent pair of cans. So the sound supervisor used to come down from the gallery, check the cans, he used to put them on. He said, there's nothing wrong with those cans. 
give them back the bread in, check the switch, and they tell a terrible crackling. He said, listen to this now. And of course, you know, he's went on for years and years and years, and Brett and Griffiths never, ever, he probably doesn't know now. I hope somebody tells him. <laughs> I think my favourite, because I tend to be a lightly entertaining man, was light entertainment. And uh, those are the great days, of course, that the, the main thing was disco down every week for weeks and weeks. And it was, consisted of a series of groups, folk, folk music, and then we used to pack the place full of uh, audiences and kids, grown-ups a lot from all over Wales, br bring them up in busloads. Were surrounded by great characters they were wonderful um, especially the band we spent a lot of time with the band uh, fellas generally 10 15 years older than us been around a bit good players but characters and one in particular John Tyler GT we call him he was into everything and Benny Litchfield wonderful man Uncle Ben everyone called him Uncle Ben he ran the band like a family and if there's any problem Uncle Ben had sorted out. And one week, Ben had asked one of the players, I think it was the, the trumpet player, to play trumpet and clarinet. And at the end of the week, this fellow got it more money than anyone else because he was doing what they called a doubling. He was doubling up. So everyone else wanted to play two instruments. Bit of a problem for John because he, it was all he could do to set his drums up. Now, he mind play anything else. So Benny said, what about a marimba? What on earth is a marimba? And John explained that it was a, um, a Latin American type instrument, which was a, a piece of wood with slats in it, and you played it with a thin stick of wood, and it made a kind of a noise, you know? Nice, rumbly noise. So Ben said, yeah, okay, I'll write you a bit of marimba. Well, come the day now, we used to rehearse in the afternoon, and he went out live, disco down now, this is. And in amongst all this, there used to be a thing called, we called it, the Splot Triathlon. Somebody worked out, it was exactly 100 yards from the BBC to the BBC club. You had to run there, drink a pint, and run back before anyone noticed, and of course without being ill. <laughs> so John attempted the, uh, the Splot Triathlon, did it, but left his marimba in the club. Three minutes to transmission. There he is behind the screen, and when we get into the thing, he suddenly realises it's gone. No marimba. Amazing thing was, during the transmission, the sound was perfect. The marimba part was played to perfection. The best it was ever... Benny was conducting away. What he didn't know was, the marimba was actually Johnny Tyler's false teeth. He'd taken him out quick as a flash, picked up a drumstick and... He was known as the virtuoso of the top set. I'm not kidding, laugh. He nearly bought her own that night, eh? I'll tell you about Benny Litchfield. I promise I won't keep you long. He came from North many years ago to live in the land of song. He should be Cardiff born and Cardiff bred. When he dies, he'll be Cardiff dead. They'll build a little Martin's flock. In memory of them, and Auntie Molly, yeah. We had a grand piano, an old grand piano, which was used as props. It was all right, good piano. They used to use it off shots, but uh, it wasn't very good. Well, for this particular programme, they'd also hired a grand piano. And for the next comedy programme, they wanted the piano sprayed pink, some children's programme. So they sprayed the piano, but unfortunately they sprayed the wrong one, they sprayed the hired one. <laughs> Took some cleaning off. 
there were always things, ca uh, cameras crashing into people, and of course, it, it, when it was live, there was nothing you could do about it. I used to think it was normal. If you didn't have a shot at the back of somebody's head, I used to think somebody was wrong. Where's that fella's head? He wasn't on this week. And I remember another occasion in Studio B, uh, somebody, I, th I think it was a, that was a sort of a magazine hobbies program which Cliff Morgan used to present. And somebody brought these rare Chinese carp in. And we were gonna do the program next day and they had to be in warm water. And uh, for s some reason or other, we, we uh, bypassed the thermostat. And when we got in next morning ready to record the program, <laughs> the water was boiling. <laughs> And all these fish floated on the top. Um, that didn't go down very well at all. They uh, had a programme which was called Telly Welly, which Evelyn Williams would, would, uh, would produce, which was marvellous. And um, you had a guy coming along explaining things about science to small children, very small children. And this guy used to come along, he was a Welsh academic, and um, one day he came along and he had these fireworks with him. And he was explaining about fireworks. And everything had gone well in rehearsal. It seemed to go anyway. Well, Glyn started <laughs> with one end and was rapidly putting everything in the paper, uh, trying to make a firework. And then he lit it. And of course, it sparked. And he had a sprinkler in his hand. And I'll never forget this. One of the moments of great horror. The sprinkler in his hand and a box quite far away of fireworks. And as he talked, I could see, all of us could see a thin plume of smoke coming up on his left from the fireworks. We are done here now, but we are done Well, but Hucklin, I'm in the blind, and he dial at it. Unbeknown to me, of course, I thought this was all very close within our little studio. The program was being recorded by an engineer who uh, saw it and laughed and laughed and laughed, as we all did afterwards, and um, showed it to the Tonight team in London. And that night, November the 5th, it went out on BBC One. And he was very sardonic and he had this wonderful sneer. And he said, I want to show you something quite amusing, he said. This is what happens when they do a program on fireworks from Wales. And he sneered. And this film came up, some swine in Wales had <laughs> sent the film up, the part that had been excised from here. Yeah. You saw these people running about, the, the Welsh academics sort of running around the desk being pursued by fireworks and smuts falling in all directions, smoke, etc., etc. We were all terribly upset. We'd been exposed as a crowd of incompetence. However, there we are. There's a, a remarkable camaraderie because small is beautiful, I think. When we moved from Broadway to Sandiff, we lost it all. We lost it all. And everyone goes crazy. You rock a by your baby rum. And everything gets lazy. Push a by, I'll buy you this and that. You hear a daddy saying, and baby goes home to her flat to sleep all day. I've known some great endings. <laughs> <laughs> and God bless you all for watching. <laughs>